So today we're going to finish up Solidity, and then I'm going to give you a lot of time to get through the Solidity labs. Uh, I think it's really important for you to just do as much Solidity program this week as you programming this week as you can. Um, uh, so uh, I'm gonna. So the previous class, I went through enough Solidity for you to do the first two lessons of the Crypto Zombies uh, exercise. Uh, this class, I'm going to give you the rest. So you should be able to do all six lessons. Um, the actual documentation in the, in the Crypto Zombies site is, is quite good. So you could actually go through those just by reading it. But I just wanted to give you a quick overview of some of the topics uh, that, that are covered in the rest of the, the Crypto Zombies. So uh, one of the things that you'll find in Solidity is that there's support for library calls. Uh, so, so you don't have to re-implement everything from scratch. Uh, the, there's this standard uh, open Zeppelin repository. It's almost like a de facto repository for uh, code that you can just borrow from other people in your smart contract. Um, and if you want to use code uh, from this repository, you just bring in the you bring in the version of the library that you want, the source code, and then you just import it, similar to Python. You can include things in two ways. Uh, one is to just, is to, in the library code, they'll implement some contracts, and then you can just inherit from that contract like we talked about in the previous class. The other way to do this is you can import a library that only includes functions. It doesn't include a base contract uh, that you would derive from. So those are the two different ways. Uh, here's an example of the first way, the ownership co an ownership contract is what this thing supports. So one of the things you'll have on, the, on, on a smart contract is the notion of who owns the contract, who's the admin of the contract, who can control the contract. So rather than everyone implementing it their own way, uh, you can use a standard ownership contract. So here's an ownable contract. It's got a, an address for the owner. Uh, in this case, it's private. Uh, it has a constructor that sets the owner to initially the message sender. Whoever creates this contract is the, new, is the owner. And then there's, in, in this particular contract, you can see who the owner is by calling this, um, this public function, which will return the, the owner. So even though this is declared as private, the only way you can access this typically is with this function call. What's the word view? Uh, did I not mention that? Uh, view means, uh, view is, so the, the, yeah, there's view and there's pure. View means any full node can give you the answer without coordinating with all the other full nodes. So these are uh, operations that just read state from the blockchain. They don't actually have to commit a transaction. Pure means it doesn't even need to read state. It's just like a, a math function. There are these, these two labels are in solidity. Uh, I think, yeah, it was in the last class that I mentioned that. But uh, it's, just a, it's just a semantic label. Okay, so then this contract can do things like, you know, I want to create a modifier that says uh, this thing is protected by uh, only owner. So only the owner can, can execute a certain function call. So I require is owner to be true, and then I call the original function. And then the is owner function is here, and it returns whether or not the message sender is the owner. So it's a typical... Typical way you would set up ownership. You could implement uh, removal of an owner. So renounce ownership is a function call that says, you know what, as soon as this thing gets deployed, I want to now set the owner to address zero. And the reason why you would do this is because you want to disable God mode in your smart contract, right? You know, if you deploy a smart contract and everybody's like, okay, uh, I want to be, I want everybody to play by the rules as co-equals. Well, I can't have an owner. <laughs> Maybe the owner starts out setting everything up, but then eventually I'm not going to send money unless that person renounces ownership to get rid of all the admin features. 
So that would be, I mean, that's, that's typically, if it's a contract, that it should be a contract of co-equals. I can't implement a backdoor that says only owner can withdraw all the money of the contract. So, uh, well, apparently it just happened with the one contract, uh, but yeah. There's a lot of unscrupulous activity going on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you can also transfer ownership. So maybe if you want to keep God mode on there and you want to implement transfer ownership, and this is just an example uh, of, of some base class that you might want to import, uh, then you can, you can implement something that, that, uh, is, that's going to check whether or not the owner of the contract is calling it. And if the owner is calling it, then I can call this internal function transfer ownership where uh, if the new owner is not equal to address zero, I will transfer ownership to that new owner. It's just a simple, simple base, a base contract that you might import from Open Zeppelin to use in your own contracts. Uh, another common way is to include code as library code. So uh, to give you some motivation, the most common uh, library that I've seen is SafeMap. So what happens here? What do you think happens here? I have a uint 8 and I set it to 255 and then I increment number by 1. What does number equal after I do this operation? This is 0, so that's overflow. And then what happens here? What's number after this? 255. So yeah, uh, same as C, you have integer overflow and underflow. So this motivates Open Zeppelin's safe map library. Uh, and if you see a contract that's not using this, that contract has probably got a bug in it uh, that can be owned. So everybody is using this safe map, which, is, which then makes you wonder, well, if the addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division operation are useless in Solidity, if everyone's doing this, then why do we have them? So that's a good question to ask. Uh, so what safe library, the safe math library does, it performs the operations, but then it includes an assert that will invalidate the whole transaction if any of these conditions, if overflow or underflow has happened. So uh, before we get into the safe math library, the first thing is you define libraries similar to contracts. Instead of the contract keyword, you use a library keyword. So here I have a library safe math, and I've implemented addition as uh, taking two uh, variables A and B. I return C as, well, I calculate C as A plus B, but then I make sure I assert that C is still greater than or equal to A. So this is similar to x86 do it t detecting an overflow condition using condition flags. That's basically what this thing is doing. I add two numbers and the result better be uh, bigger than, than either one. It, it would have been the same if it, it would have checked for C greater than or equal to B as well. So that's all the safe math library does for all the operations. Uh, you would use a library by calling the using key, by using the using keyword. Uh, and that associates the library methods to a specific data type. So here's an example. I have uint 256s, and I am going to use the safe math call for this data type. So you associate the library code to that data type here on this line. And then I have a integer a and if I want to add b to it, I say a dot add 3, and that will call into the, the addition uh, function in the safe math library. Similarly, I have a mole uh, 2, uh, and I accumulate that on c. So that, what, what that does is it calls into the multiplication. So this is the safe math multiplication. And you'll note that this thing has two parameters. Implicitly, the first parameter is is this argument here, and then the second parameter is, is what's in the function call. So this is uh, a times 2, and then that returns c, which is, which is this, and it does this assert to make sure that c divided by a gets you back b to prevent, to detect overflow. Okay. Uh, you might ask, well, what about uint 8, uint 16, uint 32s? Turns out you have to, like, have one of those, you have to have all four, like, 
add, subtract, multiply, and divide for each one of these data type sizes. So that's a pain in the neck. Uh, but that's what that's the way it's implemented right now. Uh, another part of solidity is time. So there is this now keyword that returns the Unix timestamp in terms of number of seconds since the epoch in January 1st, 1970 is the, uh, the beginning. Uh, so it's the number of seconds since then. And uh, you can access that by using this keyword now. Uh, so last updated is equal to now is, the, is, is a way you can get the timestamp into this variable. Uh, the really uh, interesting thing is that this looks like a variable now, but it's actually a function call. Because every time you call this, it's going to be different on different blocks. So this, is, this can be quite confusing for someone who's just used to variable names and, and pulling variable names. Uh, I don't know why they don't say now with the two parentheses. It should, seems like it should be a function call, uh, but that's just the way it is. Uh, there is also some native time conversion uh, features in the language itself so that you're not always going back and forth between seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, and years because that's a pain. So you can write something like this. If now is greater than or equal to last updated pl plus five minutes, this will convert this minutes keyword into uh, seconds and then do that comparison as you would expect just as a shortcut. Uh, random numbers or lack thereof, so uh, Solidity gives you access to this hash function and you will use the hash function's avalanche uh, effect to get a random distribution of output. So here's an example where you have a nonce, zero, and I want to generate random numbers from that. Say I want to generate two random numbers between zero and 99. Then I could do something like this where I take the hash of, uh, this is a way of encoding a bunch of values into one string. So this is now the sender and, and the nonce. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll increment the nonce and I'll create for random two the same thing and then I'll mod both of those by 100. And this will give you a pseudo random function as you would expect. Uh, the problem is is that it's pseudo random, meaning that once people know the seeds that you're using, they can deterministically guess your random number. Uh, so how can they do that? Uh, so one of the questions you can ask, so if you look at this thing, uh, the message sender is known, the nonce is known because it's part of this smart contract. The only thing that might not be known is now, but who do you think controls the now variable? Who, who generates now? Client. This is a blockchain. So, do, did I define this here? So now is the Unix timestamp of the latest block. First of all, the range is quite narrow, but then the actual specific number that's used, the miner does. So the miner can choose a value to his or her advantage within some window. Now it can't, the, the timestamp can't be before the previous block's timestamp, because then that's like a time, like then you're trying to insert an old block. It can't be too far ahead, but within a, a range of perhaps 10 minutes, or wait, so the block, for the block time is 20 seconds. Within that range, you can twiddle the timestamp. So that's, that, um, uh, that is a disadvantage. Uh, what if the miner doesn't like the random number generated after mining for a particular uh, timestamp, for a particular version of now? So say uh, it picks a version of now, and then it does the mining, and it, and it generates this random number, and it doesn't like the random number. Say the miner is actually participating in your contract that uses the random, say, you're, say you implemented a lottery contract, and the miner is sitting there, the miner entered your lottery, and is sitting there and finds that, oh, this, this version of now doesn't win me the lottery. What do you, it, but, but it mined it correctly. What do you think the miner will do? Redo it. It'll redo it, and it will suppress the validly mined block. 
So this is, this is gaming the system by the miner. The miner is trying to shift the odds so that if the miner is participating in your smart contract, uh, the miner will, you know, will, will tilt the odds into his or, her uh, his or her favor. So this is part of the DASP top 10, which we're going to talk about. So after we get through the initial solidity contracts, we will talk about issues where uh, these kinds of things are happening to, to smart contracts. Okay, so in, uh, in general, agreeing on random numbers on the blockchain is problematic. Uh, you, can do, you can try and think about ways of securely flipping a coin, and you'll realize that this is nearly impossible to do. A lot of people are trying to develop protocols to make secure coin flipping possible on the blockchain, uh, but typically you have to have some uh, frame of reference as a ground truth, and then if people know what that ground truth is, they can generate the random numbers that you're going to uh, produce. Okay, so contracts that rely on random numbers can be vulnerable to exploitation, which we'll see later. Uh, the next thing that a contract will do is transfers and withdrawals. Uh, so how does a smart contract send and receive ether to and from other wallets and, and contracts? Uh, so here's an example of a contract. It's called get paid. Uh, and we're going to implement this withdraw function and only the owner can get paid. So this is the, you know, cashing out the contract. Uh, so you can specify in this withdraw that uh, only the owner can 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 access it, and then you set this address to the owner. And then what you'll do is you'll call this address this dot balance. And what this will do is this will get the entire balance of the smart contract's uh, funds. So a smart contract can receive uh, ether. And when it re receives ether, this, this balance uh, attribute is attached to the address of the smart contract. So this specifies this particular smart contract. I want to get to its address. And then from its address, I want to see the entire balance. So this is a blockchain value. The full nodes will take this and we'll, we'll see the amount of ether that that contract has. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this owner.transfer. So addresses in Solidity have a built-in method called transfer so that I can actually transfer uh, to this owner this amount. So this is the smart contract transferring to a particular recipient uh, this ether. So that's the way a contract, there's multiple ways contracts can send and receive ether. This is just one of them, the transfer method. Okay, is that, yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, so hopefully the owner is specified in the constructor, or you have got that ownership contract that's, that specifies uh, who the owner is, and then only the owner can actually pull the, the, uh, the entire balance uh, off of that. Okay, here's an example, just two more examples of using transfers. You have a consignment store, uh, and this store takes a particular amount of commission for everything that it sells, and some buyer wants to buy an item from an owner, and that's the, the address of the owner is there. And so the consignment store will accept payment from the buyer, and then we'll do some transferring, and then eventually the consignment store needs to transfer part of the money that was sent by the buyer over to the item owner. So it says item owner dot item owner dot transfer. It's going to take the amount of ether that the buyer has sent it using message dot value, subtract off the commission, and then the the commission is kept in the consignment store, and then the the buyer's funds are given to the uh, the item owner, okay? Here's another uh, online, con uh, online store contract. Say you are uh, accepting payment for items and someone sends you more money than the item is worth. So then you would do something like this. This is the item price, 0.01 ether, and then message.sender transfer, message value minus the item price, the actual item price. So you should look at this and say, 
why isn't this using safe math? And you would be correct in saying that what happens if I try and buy something? Well, hopefully the, the checks are such that this doesn't underflow because then I can wipe out the contract, right? Like if, if, uh, if I sent 0.001 ether, I better not get to this line. Otherwise, I have just gotten this contract to send up a whole bunch of ether to me. So that should be a red flag. Uh, yeah. OK. Uh, another really common use for smart contracts is to in implement tokens. So these are things that track ownership of stakes. So each token, there are, are token standards that have been defined. And each token standard specifies a, an interface for uh, particular contracts to implement if they want to be uh, compliant with this, with this standard. So there are many kinds of tokens, but the two token types that are mainly being used are 721 and 20. And this is the ERC stands for uh, Ethereum Request for Comments, uh, which is the, the standardization sequence for Ethereum. So the ERC 721 standard, these are unique, meaning that they're, it's not like cash, where you can interchange cash for each other. Like it, you know, your $10 bill and my $10 bill are all the same, and we can, we can exchange it. These are for unique tokens, like collectibles. And they're indivisible, and they're suitable for single object ownership. So the standard is there in ERC 721.org. And you would do something like this. You would import the the base class, the ERC721 base class, and then say, I want to derive something from this. So I'll be one of these ERC721 tokens. And the interface that ERC721 exports, uh, this is what your, uh, your contract has to implement. The balances, the ownership of, transferring, uh, approving transfers, and taking ownership of an item are standard things that you would want to implement for this kind of this style of token. And then it also supports uh, standard events for the JavaScript web, web interface. This I'll get to at the very end of this, but uh, just note that this is, this is also what needs to get implemented. Uh, ERC20 tokens are interchangeable, so fungible, meaning that you can exchange things for each other and it's no, no difference. Uh, these are also divisible tokens, suitable for being used as, as currency. So this was intended to, to implement tradable digital assets in an interoperable manner. So if you have a, an application that is written to interact with one ERC20 token, uh, this will directly work with another one, and the same with the 721. So that's, you, you, you save from people re-implementing the same kind of uh, code with a standard interface like this. Okay. So this is commonly used to, uh, to do some crowdfunding for startup companies, doing an initial coin offering. So this ICOs that uh, were really popular a couple years ago, uh, this is what they were doing. They were, they were issuing these ERC-20 tokens if you paid into the contract with your, your cryptocurrency. So there's yeah, a couple hundred thousand of these things uh, on the blockchain. Uh, some were really successful. Uh, in terms of raising money, and the Polyswarm co podcast from that first week talks about how that particular company used that money to build a business uh, from. Uh, this is the ERC20 token interface, so similar to the 721, but there's a supply, a total supply of tokens, a balance, transferring tokens, uh, and then you see some Web3 web stuff at the bottom for the events, which we'll get to. Uh, the next thing are comments. This is similar to JavaScript, uh, single line comments via the, the double slashes, multi-line comments via slash star and star slash. Uh, you can also use this NatSpec standard for self-documenting source code. Uh, so you'll see that parameters you can specify for function calls, return values, and what, what will happen is you annotate your source code with these things. And then the documentation for, for maybe a website, like an API uh, uh, a site, will get automatically generated by these annotations. 
So if for your final project, if you are implementing a smart contract for it, you would do something like this. You would, you would annotate it with a title, the author, a, a description. And then in the contract, if you have a multiply function, then you would sort of describe it. You would talk about the parameters and their data types, and then the return values, and then this will automatically generate documentation for your, for your code. And th this is no different than other programming languages. It's uh, just good practice since we, since we are a, a computer science department. Okay, so let's talk, let's look at some example contracts, actually just one example contract to put the pieces together. Uh, here's a fundraiser contract. I have an owner, uh, the, the, the address that the money's going to go to. I have a target, uh, a target uh, uh, balance, and a fundraising value that I'm trying to meet. I have an end time that says the fundraiser will end at a certain time. And then I'm going to have a mapping of uh, an array of contributors. And these contributors are basically a structure where it's, it binds the address and the contribution for each contributor. I'll have a constructor that will uh, initialize the target that I want to meet and the duration of the fundraiser so I can set the end time. And then I'll set the owner to whoever created the contract. I'll set the target. And then I'll set the end time to now plus the duration. And then I'll implement a contribute function for people to call to uh, contribute funds to my fundraiser. Uh, if it is not yet done, so I'm below the end time, I will then push, I'll create a new contributor object using the sender and the amount of ether the sender has sent me. So message sender, message value, and I'll push that into this contributors array. Okay, so I'll keep track of the contributions and I'll keep track of who, who sent them to me. And then I'll implement a collect function and this is going to be for the owner to collect the funds, but the owner can only collect the funds if the target has been reached. So that's what these two requires do. It says the address of the contract uh, the balance of the contract has to be greater than or equal to the target, and then I have to be the owner. And if that is the case, then I'll call this thing self-destruct uh, of the owner, which I mentioned uh, in the last class. What that does is it destroys the contract and sends all of the funds in the contract to an address. And in this case, the address is the owner, and that's where the owner can just collect all the, all the money that's been raised. Uh, there is a refund function that gets called, and the refund function happens when it's greater than the end time and the balance is less than a target. And anybody can call uh, this function. So then what I'll do is I'll, I'll, in a loop, go through the entire contributors array and just transfer the amount to that contributor, the amount that they contributed. So this refunds all the money because I didn't raise enough. I didn't meet my target. Uh, and then anyone can see the balance. So that's just a simple fundraiser contract in Ethereum. In this particular contract, it cannot change. It's, it's set in the constructor and there's no code in this smart contract to change it. So this, does, this isn't one of those uh, is ownable ones where I actually had a transfer ownership call. So yeah, this, everyone knows who the owner is and there's no way around the fact that uh, this is checked. So only the owner can, can trigger that self-destruct. No, but yeah, so you're way ahead of the game, but yes, this, uh, this right here, so if you look at this, and this actually, this is an exploit that we'll talk about. If you look at this, yeah, I'm pushing uh, into this array uh, uh, contributors. So if I have someone sitting there and contributing one way 
in a loop, uh, then I can really fill up this contributor array so that this refund runs out of gas. Like if this is it, so this function call, you have to spend some gas in order to get this thing to work. And if the amount of gas that is required to go through this entire loop exceeds the block gas limit, you're done. Your contract is bricked. Nobody, like the owner can't collect this. Well, no, the owner can collect eventually by having enough people contribute money. The, but you, can, you, cannot, you cannot do this refund. Uh, so yeah, this part of the contract is bricked. If, if in fact, there are so many contributors that this loop runs out of gas uh, on the, uh, the, the block gas limit, the global one. So we'll revisit this for, yeah, there'll be, because uh, you can, this is actually done, this is, this is done all right. So uh, at least this is a linear thing. Like there isn't, there aren't any gaps in the array. You're just actually going one after another. So you would have to go through a lot of, of, of contributors in order to saturate the, that. But here is, I mean, this is also a preview. This is Turing complete. I can do an infinite loop here. Uh, and this is where some of the issues are in, in executing a smart contract. Okay, uh, I'm going to briefly talk about Web3.js before letting you uh, work on this uh, crypto zombies thing. So Web3.js is, is some JavaScript library code that allows you as a site to uh, interact with the web browser. So you're connecting up the web browser, which is where, the way most people want to interact with the blockchain. Uh, it connects up the web browser to the nodes that are running the actual smart contracts. Uh, and, it's, and this JavaScript not only interfaces between the browser and the blockchain, but it also inter, uh, interfaces with any wallets. Because tied into uh, this is your wallet to sign the transactions that go into the blockchain. Okay, so the JavaScript that you would deliver to the browser is going to allow you to do something like this. Say, hey, I have a smart contract called Crypto Zombies. Uh, the method in that contract I want to call is create random zombie, and I want to give it this parameter, and I want to send this transaction, or this function, yeah, this transaction to, uh, from my wallet address, to this contract using this amount of gas. So this is something that in the JavaScript you would want to deliver to someone visiting a web page so that they can then go and create that zombie. Uh, and then this is what gets sent. It's basically JSON RPC, which is very similar to a REST API. If you've uh, covered REST APIs in any of your classes, uh, it just sends this, this object, this, basically this JSON object, that says, uh, and this is going to communicate to a full node. It says, send this transaction uh, from my wallet address that I specified here to this contract address, which is specified by the crypto zombies uh, variable. And I'm going to have a certain amount of gas, gas price value. And then this is the actual function call that, this is the function call signature of this create random zombie. So that's, this is underneath the hood. This is what the JavaScript is sending to a full node to say, do a transaction for me. Okay. Uh, so in order for you to get this to work, you have to specify the full node that you want your web browser to interact with. And that's sent through the JavaScript. So say CryptoZombies wants to use an Infura full node. So you, you specify that in your JavaScript. So if you have a, a distributed application and you want to make sure that thing is reliable and you don't want to rely on Infura, then you would set up a full node to handle requests from the application that you're sending your users in the JavaScript. And this is how you would do it in JavaScript. You just uh, create a new Web3 instance, and then from there on, your interactions with this Web3 variable will get pointed to uh, this, this full node here. Okay, the other part of Web3.js is that it interfaces with any kinds of uh, crypto, uh, the, the wallets, the cryptocurrency wallets. So we're using MetaMask, and MetaMask is just a browser extension. Uh, and it, 
will inject itself into Web3 on a page in order to set this current provider um, to itself. So Web3 has this notion of who is going to be the wallet for this web page. And one of the things that the JavaScript will do is it'll allow you to set MetaMask as your wallet. Uh, when you visit uh, MyCrypto, it asks you, how do you want to connect up a wallet? So, and then there's, you, there's a table of different wallets. There will be one specific one for MetaMask, and that's where the connection will go from Web3, well, the configuration of Web3 to use MetaMask will happen there. Um, so this is how it gets loaded into a Web3 uh, page. Uh, on the page load, if, it's, if Web3 is not defined, it creates this using its, uh, the current provider or the wallet. Uh, and then, in order to get the, the wallet into the context of Web3, you would specify a user account that says, you know what, I want the zeroth uh, account address. So one of the things that you'll, when we get to MetaMask, you can change the different accounts. You can have multiple uh, wallets in MetaMask. So this just says, get the zeroth account out of, uh, out of my wallet. This is what it looks like. This is a figure of what it looks like. I have an app here, and within the app, I have configured it to point to this MetaMask plugin, and I've also pointed it to a full node that's not shown here. I have a user that clicks buy, and as part of this app, it has uh, hooked into MetaMask for the, for, the uh, for the wallet, and so for this buy, this will actually do that JSON RPC, and the JSON RPC will get signed by the MetaMask plugin. So this is where the MetaMask thing will, will pop up, and you confirm the action and sign it. And then once this has been done, it actually creates that transaction and sends it to the, the actual full node. This is where the Infura uh, full node hosting uh, that contract is. Okay. So interacting with contracts in Web3.js, the first thing you need is the contract address. So that you're just pulling off. Uh, pulling off from the from the blockchain directly. You also need what's known as the application binary interface. You need to be able to format a JSON RPC with the correct values. So that's what's known as the ABI. And all throughout the CTF, you'll be copying and pasting a contract ABI because that's the that's the interface uh, that you specify. So in the Crypto Zombie CTF, this is. Uh, the ABI is typically included as a JavaScript file. So in, in, the, in the HTML, the head section of the HTML, you'll see this script that includes CryptoZombies ABI.js, for example. And this is what the ABI looks like. It's just specifying an interface uh, for all of the different calls that this thing supports. So in this case, there's a function called approve uh, that will take the two as a It'll take some parameters, including the two and the token ID, and then it'll approve a particular uh, uh, operation on it. So that's that. This is basically your interface to the smart contract, and all of the function calls that you would want to interact with the smart contract with are included in this ABI. So then, if you have defined this in this JavaScript file, then to instantiate this. All you have to do, since this is the my ABI variable that specifies the ABI, to instantiate this contract so I can call create zombies, for example, I'll just attach the ABI, the contract address, and then from there on, programmatically in my JavaScript, I can then call into the contract. Okay. Uh, Web3 has two facilities for interacting with the contract. It's either the call or the send. Uh, the call is used to invoke view or pure functions in the ABI. So this is just pulling data from, the, uh, from the, the full node. So you can use the call. So uh, if you've instantiated the crypto zombies contract as we did previously, you can call the method in that crypto zombies to get the zombies by ID. So that's one of the functions that the crypto zombies ABI supports. And this will retrieve the data on a particular zombie with a particular ID. So because this is, this is just view and pure functions, 
This will run on the local node, so no gas is required. You won't get a contract, you won't get MetaMask asking you for money because this is very low, um, low cost for the full node to, to pass, pass back. And then it'll return a JSON object. After you do this, it will return the information about your zombie. Uh, the send is the operation that is going to create a transaction to send to the blockchain so it can actually change the state of the contract. Uh, and this will require the user to pay gas to execute because you're asking all the full nodes to change the state uh, as a result of your function call. And so when this happens, you'll get a pop-up. Uh, MetaMask will say, hey, you're trying to submit a transaction to the blockchain. Uh, specify the amount of gas that you want with this transaction, it will do its best to guess the amount of gas that you need to execute that function call, uh, but you can actually tweak the, the transaction before it, before it goes. Uh, so in this case, if you want to call the send, you would do something like this. Uh, again, this is from the AB, I, I instantiated this contract, and then I'm going to call into create random zombie with a name, and then I'm going to set, use send be, uh, and then specify the from account because then I have to actually pay money using this account in order to create that zombie on the blockchain. Uh, when that pop-up is clicked on, MetaMask is going to automatically sign this transaction in order for it to be funded from your wallet. So you need the signature of MetaMask to actually get that to, to be approved. And then all the full nodes will validate that, that that's your signature for that particular uh, wallet address. Uh, when that transaction is sent, the message.sender of the transaction is also sent with it so that the, the contract owner can figure out who this is from. And that would be your public key, the public key of the wallet. Uh, one of the things that you'll get, have to get used to is that there's a significant delay before your transaction is committed on the blockchain. Usually like a minute uh, is, is what happens. If you're waiting for longer than a minute, then what you'll need to do when MetaMask asks you to approve a transaction, you'll need to edit that transaction to make it go faster. And there's a, there's a UI for trying to make your transactions go faster on that to increase the gas price is basically what you're going to do. Okay, um, I think I'm going to skip this and then just let you hack on Solidity for the rest of the time. So now you can completely finish Lab 2.2, um, get, get as, get, quickly get through all the lessons uh, as, as quickly as you can with all the, uh, what, what I've given you.